Hi everyone and uh, welcome to this session today. My name is Steph Clark. I'm the Head of Programmes uh, at Creative England and I'm really, really excited to be joined by some fantastic panellists this morning as we kind of have a discussion about what's next for AR and VR in 2021. Um, so a very brief sort of background about Creative England first. We're um, an organisation that exists to support creative and cultural businesses in the country. Um, we do this by investing in companies. Um, so we give cash in sort of form of grants, loans and equity funding and we also run um, a series of business support programmes around the country which are specially designed to help creative companies um, grow their enterprises, uh, develop new IP, access finance and basically grow and scale and thrive. So I'm actually going to be hosting a session later on today at quarter to three called Keeping Good Company and I'll be taking people through all of the different business support offers and funding that we have available at the moment. So if you're still around this afternoon and uh, you want to find out more about what we do you can you can join that session. But um, now I'm going to introduce our panellists. So I'm really delighted to be welcomed by Simon Benson, who's the head of, uh, sorry, Director of Immersive Technology at The Host, which was the former landing in Media City. Vicky Roberts from VTime, uh, Maxwell Boardman from Immersive by Education, and Jeff Cockman from MapMe. So welcome everyone, and thank you so much for giving up some time this morning to have a chat with me. Um, can I go to you first, Simon, to introduce yourself and perhaps uh, tell everyone a bit more about yeah. what you do. I'm the immersive technology um, host. So at host, we focus on incubating, growing businesses, uh, a lot focused in the immersive and creative sector, um, a lot of emphasis on uh, immersive, obviously at the moment with VR and AR and things like that being a, a real major thing for the future, uh, but also things like cyber and AI and all sorts of other uh, advanced technology things with businesses. Uh, recently, we've also got the Unity Center of Excellence there, which is quite an amazing new landing uh, thing for Media City itself and lots of opportunities there in terms of, you know, skilling and things like that with our new academy and things like that we can teach people how to use these tools that are actually used to create things like games and virtual reality applications and things like that. Uh, very briefly, my background is video games, but I got into that through military simulation of all things in the first instance and doing quite advanced engineering things but that all the same skills really go across a lot of these areas. So started in military, moved into the video games where I was there for 20 years, and then uh, got all these things like gold discs and platinum discs and stuff like that for my time in video <laughs> games. And then um, moved from there into more technology related areas where I was one of the creators of things like the PlayStation virtual reality, 3D gaming, and those kind of elements. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and it's really, really exciting as well about the, the Unity uh, accreditation, so congratulations on that. Um, Vicky, can I go to you next? Yep. Hi, I'm Vicky, Hi. I'm Head of Marketing at VTime. Uh, we're a VR and AR studio based in Liverpool. Um, VTime basically uses cutting edge technology to create very human, very immersive communication experiences in alternative realities. Um, we're best known for cross-reality social network VTime XR um, that launched in 2015. And that basically allows you and up to three other people to sit, chat, and share together in virtual environments from wherever you are in the world. That's had more than a million downloads to date. And more recently, we launched an AR avatar messaging app called VTag, which launched globally to the end of last year. Um, the company has been around since 2013, but we moved into um, virtual reality in 2015 after a, an app that we were creating for iPad we, we decided to try it out on an emerging headset we found it re worked really well we tried to add more social elements to it and that was an early version basically of what ended up being VTime and the rest is history we're fully immersive all the time now. Wow so how have you guys been dealing with uh, obviously lockdown and sort of being at home are you kind of meeting in in virtual reality, you're using your own, yeah, your own yeah, product. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you'll hear a bit later, we um we do a lot of things in virtual realities, including having our own um, Christmas parties this year in in our network. It's pretty cool. So. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Um, Maxwell, can I come to you next? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm, I'm Max. I'm co-founder and CTO of Immersive Education, and we develop um resources for higher education using uh, we're sort of enriched with technology so some of that being augmented reality some being ai 
generally using things like gamification and personalization to really bridge that gap between theory and practical. So where sort of textbooks that can be quite disengaging, they're very cumbersome and time consuming to create um, our products are more sort of catered to the, the modern generation of student. It allows that, that um, practical experience as well as the theoretical content that's got visual elements, 3D, uh, interactive animations, and really just creates an experience that is sort of important on the, the education market. I actually just just lost you a little bit towards the end there, Max. I don't know if that was just for me or or you just sounded a little bit faint. So, um, but we, but thank you. We did. I think we did get the um, gist of that. Thank you. And how long has Immersify been been going for? Yeah. So we uh, were founded um, last year, twenty nineteen, and we've raised around the funding since then. We actually were um, part of the the host co working space for a little while back in the start of that sort of late 2019, early 2020, and the pandemic hit and that changed, changed a lot of things with how, how lots of businesses operate and we decided to go down a more remote route on a more permanent basis. Great, well, well, I'm sure we we'll want to hear a bit more about that and how you found the last sort of 12 months um, a bit later on. Um, Jeff, can I come to you next? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm oh, looks like a dog. I'm Jeff Ockland. Um, I'm the um, MD, but I'm actually um, classed as a fun engineer. Um, so I make things fun. Um, been going since 2001. So we're a long stay in the digital space, but we're still at the cutting edge of a lot of the stuff we do. And um, we have worked with every single business sector you could possibly imagine <laughs> and pretty much a lot of celebrities, musicians, theme parks and um, across all the different aspects. So we used to produce a lot of games originally in Flash. We uh, adapted to augmented reality in Flash about 14 years ago. So before anyone's thinking about augmented reality or even what augmented reality is, we were experimenting with augmented reality and what you could actually do via webcams or Flash. Obviously, um, a lot of the technology has changed. We jumped onto some of the original AR stuff, especially for Merlin in Alton Towers. We did a lot of AR sort of stuff. And we've done a lot of AR stuff, a lot of different um, clients over the years. But, you know, our, our business sectors, we, we worked with the Colours, we made all their computer games, we worked with Lily Allen, we worked with Warwick Davis, we worked with Alton Towers, we worked with the world's leading maze designers, we designed escape rooms. Um, about before COVID, all of our business was pretty much in the leisure industry, and then COVID hit, and we lost all of our clients, which was a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> um, so, we, so we adapted, and we went into mental health and education, and realised that that was the key thing that was needed at the moment. And um, I've realised over the twenty years of doing it, the technology that I, I use technology now. And so it's game the good, you know, um, technology for change. So everything we try and do needs to have a aspect of the technology because I thought when I got into technology about 30 years ago, technology would save us, but I think it's enslaving. And I think we need to make a positive step to back what technology should be. And because I deal with a lot of kids um, who have got mental health problems directly resulting in technology usage, I'm a technologist, but we need to consider all aspects positive and negative what time technology does to our lives mm -hmm. and that's you raised a really really interesting point there about the um the sort of ethics around technology and, and usage so yeah that would be really i think really good to kind of get into a bit later on in the in the discussion um i guess i don't really want to sort of you know dwell on this subject too much because i think everyone's probably sick and tired of talking about it but i guess we can't not mention it um in terms of COVID and the pandemic and everything, you know, been going on for the past 18 months. From your sort of point of view in your respective organisations, other than what's sort of happened you know, directly for, you, for your business and, and the effects of that, across sort of immersive in general as an industry, has have any of you kind of seen any sort of significant, you know, changes or developments that you feel are, you know, a result of the pandemic? That certainly is. Um, where I work as a consultant and work with a lot of different businesses in a lot of different fields. And I think what I'd say that the pandemic was, as far as VR was concerned, it kind of gave with one hand and took with another, if you like, in that the whole sector at the time was moving into out of home VR. So the idea of VR arcades, you know, VR on the high street where you could go and get an amazing experience. 
there was a big drive for that area and that was seen as a huge unlocking opportunity for engagement so people could go there maybe sample VR and realize what it actually is it's still that thing where many people still haven't tried it so by getting it into the high street and into these go-to places where people don't have to buy you know invest in a headset themselves they can actually try it out understand what it is see the value and then maybe go and follow up and buy something for the home that entire sector just disappeared practically overnight and then you know forced everyone to try and look for new opportunities but also i think on the flip side of that the vr headsets in the home almost became the wee sports of lockdown you know when when people were looking for opportunities to maybe let their children engage with digital content but in a way where they're getting a bit of exercise vr sort of had that opportunity where people were seeing it as a bit more physical rather than sitting on a sofa people up and about moving about so i think you know it had that sort of strange um you know negativity on one hand but positivity on the other way it brought it into the home for people that were particularly looking for a bit more you know physical uh, engagement with digital content but what about yourselves vicky i mean obviously you guys are sort of specializing in connecting people you know when when you can't be there physically in person have you sort of seen more take up with your kind of products in general or yeah i mean i think that for anybody who was already concentrating on distance eliminating solutions while the last 14 months have undoubtedly been awful um, there was immediate opportunity and immediate uptake that we saw um, in terms of usage uh, we also found that as well as bringing in new users there was also um, I've also seen a change in perception um, Simon alluded it to it before there's a lot of people who've never even tried VR at this point um, and I think that COVID essentially removed the why would I want to do that for a lot of people uh, made it more of a, a viable thing so lockdown coupled with the launch of things like the Quest 2 headset which was fabulous price, wonderful piece of kit, saw so a huge new wave of people who had never tried VR before suddenly using VR during lockdown where they're looking for extra things to do. And in terms of what that looked like for us, we saw um, immediately a 30% uplift in new daily active users. We had improved um, session times across the board. We started to get a lot of inquiries from businesses who were looking to move their meetings, events online, and even Christmas parties like we spoke about before. And uh, we were also able to work with um, businesses like the Cornerstone Partnership who work with vulnerable children. We were able to give them a private version of the network so that their work could continue during lockdown. So that was all hugely positive. Um, I think that many people maybe had seen VR as a, a gaming platform or gimmicky before but again as Simon alluded to a lot of people started to see VR as a lifeline during COVID as it gave them the opportunity to socialize exercise meditate go to events and hang out with people outside their houses and we're seeing studies coming through now that show that the effects of um, VR on well-being during pan the pandemic have been incredible and there was a quote that I really loved from an LA Times article that said <coughs> All it took to make me a believer of virtual reality was for reality to break. And that's 100% a sentiment that I've seen come through in um, letters that we've got from users. And I don't think that's going to go away after the pandemic, because I think that people don't necessarily want things to go back to the way that they were. They want more of a home work balance. And I think that um, we've also seen studies come through that zoom fatigue is real there was a stanford university paper which came out in february and video calls can be really draining so we're seeing how immersive tech can help with that we can communicate and collaborate with friends um, and family and so it's all hugely positive for me yeah i'm really disappointed about the sort of the gimmick kind of argument you know i definitely remember having conversations with friends and family a couple of years ago trying to kind of you know get them get across to them sort of the power really of like of, of vr particularly and that word exactly being used now surely it's just a game we've tried it it's it's you know this it's been around forever and it has nobody sort of taken it up and i think you're right there has definitely been a real kind of shift in the sort of mainstream really definitely helped by by the launch of the quest 2 um, I was a fault. I got one myself, but <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> who didn't? Yeah. Um, Jeff, I mean, what what about yourselves? I mean, obviously, you, you've I mean, gosh, you listed off you know a, an amazing sort of client list, but then exactly as you say, you know, there was a there was a drop off in 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 your sort of clients. Over, yeah. Over yeah. Well, we specialize in mixing the physical and digital worlds. 
So I don't believe that you need to replace the physical world with digital, but the digital world needs to enhance the physical world. That, that, that's the way do over the years has been within theme parks or within zoos or within shopping centres and mixing it up a bit and doing something a bit different. Obviously the physical world disappeared <laughs> completely overnight. So we had to sort of re realise what that. What uh, Based on what Vicky said, what was fascinating is people who didn't do use technology before suddenly we're accepting technology not just um not just vr but even just zoom i mean i used to have to travel on the train to go to london all the time costing a bloody fortune and because somebody wanted to have this meeting when they could just have connected on zoom for 20 minutes so i mean i think it's made people more accepting i still have reservations personally from vr we make vr i was um quoted years ago of saying oculus rift was a gimp mask that cost 300 quid um, and got slammed for it but realistically i i have a load of developers here and um, we have vr headsets how often do they use their vr headsets not very often we personally think mixed reality and augmented reality is the future where everything goes. I think uh, the VR is a pure escapism from reality and it has its purposes. So we, we work with the fire services on fire safety and do a lot of fire safety and all that sort of stuff. One of the things the fire services has done in the past to teach kids about joyriding, um, or not about joyriding, about the dangers of joyriding, um, they thought it was a bit of shock and awe. So they thought, well, the best way to get these kids to understand it is put them in the an accident. So what they did is they filmed the real accident in 360 <laughs> of somebody being caught out of a car. And then they go to a school with that car, it's been in the they freeze, it's cold, because you have an accident, you go cold. They put the kid in the car with a VR headset on it, and then the kids are in the, actually the aftermath of the real accident and they look behind them at the horror of what's been and people being cut out. And it's so shock, they go white and they just don't realise how scary it is. And it, they realise suddenly because they're looking at his eyes. And that's where VR is really special. Nothing else allows you to immerse yourself in a way of looking from somebody else's perspective. That's where I think VR has its thing. Is VR going to be made? everyone using VR? Personally, I don't think so. I think it's too cumbersome until the technology change and maybe Apple brings something a bit more slick and low. I know that Snap are trying to do it themselves, but their glasses, you look like a bloody idiot if you wore them. Um, but I think we I think it's going to change. And I think the way it will go is where you've got a, a headsets that flick between the reality. So it's mixed AR, VR. But the actual old VR way is still reservations. I'm a technologist who's been VR since the original VR many, many years ago, and I've seen it come and go, and I think it's better, and it's better than ever before, but we still have issues, um, partly to do with older people and how they react to VR compared to younger. So we know all, when we put people over a certain age on our headset, they will be feel sick. It just, it's just going to happen. No matter what headset, certain age groups can't handle it. Younger people, no problem at all. These little issues are causing it. I um, did <laughs> once upon a time. I did a, a put a roller coaster into a VR headset as a demo for the board of directors of Merlin, and it was the worst thing I ever did because I literally made two of them very ill in the meeting, <laughs> and I, I regretted it. And I thought, mm, yeah, motion and moving roller coasters, not not the best idea. So if you ever want to do that, but so you've got to be really careful with VR and where it has its usage. I personally think augmented reality is the future of where we're going to go. I think it already is taken off on leaps and bounds. It helps out so many applications. So we do a mix of AR and VR for us. We make what the client wants to fit their solution. So there's a lot of AR and VR studios. We're not an AR and VR studio solely. We are a digital studio, and we choose the platform that's right for the particular product that we've got. It may be AR, it may be VR. It's that no one's ever heard before because we work with a lot of experimental technologies. But I think you need to choose the solution for it. But the problem at the moment with a lot of VR is people are just going, oh, well, we'll just use VR because VR gets PR you know, that famous old thing, and they're not using it for the purpose it's meant to be used for. So you end up with these poor quality experiences that switch a lot of people off too. 
So it's the sort of chase that we've got. And obviously, at the moment, it's the sort of gold rush. Everyone's got, oh, we can do everything in it, just like the early internet. You remember the early websites were uh, horrific. Um, it's the same again. You know, there's going to be a lot, a lot of bad content, and that's damaging a lot of the good content that's there. So I think it, it has its future, but I think it's the future a lot of people are envisioning. It's a good point about it, sort of, well, you, well, you raised lots there, but it not replacing other mediums. And I don't, well, I certainly don't think it would, it is a replacement for any other kind of, certainly creative mediums or in-person contact. I think that's just, yeah, it's it's not really going to be that way forward. And, um, but the, the example you used particularly about the, you know, education project and the sort of joyriding and putting putting somebody into like a physical space and then using the tool to actually, you know, see, see, see something through somebody else's eyes. I think it is an incredible kind of tool for, for empathy and, and, and those kind of like educational experiences I think will probably really stand out in a young person's life, particularly when, you know, they're kind of having, you know, adults basically tell them how to do what to do what not to do you know all day every day basically when they go to school something like that surely is going to really kind of stand out and I, I'm, I'm interested in the, the role of sort of immersive tech particularly for educational purposes and kind of making um making things stand out and making things stick and, and helping people to learn basically and I guess Max you're probably a, a, a good person to come to on on that point I mean what 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 are your views around the the role of it within education yeah, sure. That's yeah. Clear, yeah. By the way, so hopefully it's a little bit more clear. Um, yeah, and no, I agree. I think that experience in the car sounds really powerful. Um, I wouldn't want to give right. myself. <laughs> I did one. Um, I did one um, I, my background, I used to work in the university and the, the psychology department developed a, a similar kind of experience, but for um, sort of feeling empathy towards um, schizophrenia. So there was, you People experience that it was absolutely haunting, you know. There was like you know, voices appearing, just like whispering different things, getting progressively more like worse. And it was really, um, you, you sort of took it off and you were a bit like, you know, sort of tried to shake your head and try and get back into the real world again. But I think that kind of education piece is really powerful from, from VR, like kind of simulations. But I, I definitely agree that the, uh, the AR certainly is the future, and I think it's the example where there is probably more gimmicky stuff. I think you're finding that use case at the moment because in relative to other technologies, it is in its infancy. I think the, the hardware out there, you've got like HoloLens 2 and you've got like Magic Leap, which I don't think is as good as the HoloLens, but generally the AR hardware um, is still needs to catch up to the kind of dreams and the visions of the software developers, because I think a lot of technology that we, we opted on this fact to use uh, mobile AR because it allows us to kind of have that accessibility or like you can have it on mobile devices. I think LiDAR and 5G are going to be an absolute game changer for um, mobile AR. But at the moment, as it currently stands, there's still a lot you can do with um, this sort of the decks that they can, they can map. And we used it to kind of replicate clinical experiences outside of the clinic. So we developed for prim primarily um, sort of practical subjects so say for example dentistry we allowed them to bring like get that clinical experience um where lockdown kind of shut all the clinics allowed them to take that home and they could chart a patient's uh, teeth inside like in their own physical space but actually using their device as the tool so that's where the kind of ar actually provides value as opposed to being a gimmick is that the the tool is sort of attached to the device and you, you physically move your device around and there's kind of like multiplayer elements as well where people can get involved together. But I think generally um, with augmented reality, I think there's still a kind of a way to go. Um, it's sort of, it's, it's new tech and it's really kind of carving its niche, but actually the applications that will come from that, there's, um, I think you've got a lot more potential to change a lot more industries. So big uh, sort of, <laughs> on an AR then I mean I think it I think you've you brought up some really good points is that it, it is the solution that's right for the project it's not sort of shoehorning something to sort of you know fit the technology and sort of the, the, the tail wagging the dog kind of situation and I mean Simon what's obviously you're kind of developing this whole kind of you know training center basically in, in Media City for in terms of how people if they are sort of thinking about maybe exploring these technologies 
either for their own business or you know starting a career what would kind of your or what would kind of your advice be I guess to somebody mm. who's looking to get into this is is it is it is it worth it getting into it oh. is it a gimmick oh. no, no, <laughs> is it the future I agree with everything that people have said here I mean the, the fundamentally the way the world looks at these technologies and I'm totally on board with this and I can totally see it is that one day we our smartphones will be replaced by smart glasses so you know at the moment we're forever getting our phones out of our pocket and looking at them all the time and it's like why bother you know when you could just have the information in, in your field of vision you know that is going to happen and it is, isn't all that far away so we will live in a world where the majority of us will be wearing glasses even if we don't need prescription lenses because we want the information to be available to us you know intuitively and naturally and that will be a thing and people who have that will be almost like superheroes because you'll know instantly lots of things by just looking at someone you'll be able to look at the face know about a bit about the background it will remind you the names of the children when the birthday is or whatever it would be if you're in a meeting someone mentions something you don't know about it look at it automatically for you you know it'll be very enabling and therefore something that we'll all benefit from and we'll all want just as we want the internet now so i think that's definitely going to be a thing and i think thinking of that future and you think right well the underpinnings of all that is basically interactive and immersive technology pretty much going right back to the dawn of 3d gaming you know when we had our first you know games consoles that presented three-dimensional worlds you know that technology that immediacy of you know updating three-dimensional things is going to be the underpinnings of all that future because we're going to have walking around our world it's a spatial thing you know we're overlaying uh, digital content onto a real world spatially and therefore why have someone popping up in your view when you're having a video call with your parents or whatever why have them as a 2d flat thing when you can have them as a three-dimensional thing because you natively have three-dimensional vision then in your digital world so i think when it comes to getting into this the path really is to think about at the moment you know developing and if you want to develop this kind of stuff the sort of tools that make interactive and immersive content now Things like Unity, like the Unreal Engine, those kind of tool sets are underpinning the majority of all these breakthroughs in technology and are taking us to this path of where all this goes. And again, that's why at Host, you know, we we're pretty much today can announce today we're launching um, Host Salford uh, Unity Academy, hand in hand with Unity themselves, where Unity actually come in and teach people how to be professional programmers to make Unity content that is this underpinning of this immersive and interactive world basically you know those kind of careers are just going to go supernova in the UK at the moment you know that they are the paths that are going to underpin everything we won't look at Amazon in the same way anymore as a website Amazon will be something that lives in our world and it'll be built by engineers that know how to make 3d content that's quite a world that you just sort of scope <laughs> you've just mapped out for us there in your kind of role do you have I mean, are there any kind of like projects or developments that you know of that you can allude to that, you know, that kind of, you know, as examples of, of, of that thing when you said, you know, we're not that far away from it, what's what's being developed that you know of? Well, I mean, I think certainly you've seen all the glasses that have been mentioned, you know, HoloLens, Magic Leap. So the glasses are already, even Snap glasses, you know, they're already making these glasses work. They're just a little bit bulky at the moment and maybe not quite good enough, but, you know, give it five to 10 years and they'll be, they'll be, great and they'll just work so the hardware is a clear path there but from a software perspective it's pretty much when you look at the early stage now when apple for example and, and google are pushing everyone towards using our smartphones with ar apps you know that is to see the underpinnings of this new world it's like once we get used to having our phone out all the time to use google maps where it automatically looks up where you are just by the vision in your camera you know all these kind of things they're currently phone based but they'll be just ported to glasses so a lot of these AR things that are currently being made on smartphone, they're, they're already doing this job. And a lot of businesses are focusing on this idea of this spatial operating system, this world which is actually you know, um, dictated by our physical location in how we search the internet, because the world is our internet. And it's all being done at the moment, and, and there's an awful lot going down that route of, of creating this metaverse. And a lot of businesses have got this in mind. They're always thinking where that's going to take them. And, you know, I dare say, I mean, I guess Vicky's got probably something she can probably mention on this front as well. You've done some work on that with Vita, haven't you, with the spatial side of things. So worth giving an example from your side. Yeah, um, you you mentioned glasses there. Um, I don't, uh, you may or may not be aware that we've been working with 
Bram, who are the um, tech incubator of Deutsche Telekom. Um, we've been working on a project with them for the Enreal Light glasses, which um, will launch later this year. It'll only be a small amount of glasses that launches, but we're super excited to get onto wearables as soon as possible. And so that's um, another avatar communication based app where the avatars are using GPT-3. And that that's um, a super exciting project for us. Um, but yeah, everything that's been said there, I think that AR is a is for us and right now we are obviously developing apps for iPhone because that is the most accessible the most accessible piece of hardware available to to users but where wearables is is where we see the future wearables is where we see all of our products achieve all the ambitions that we have in mind because as Matt said the the hardware is always way behind the the ambitions of the people who are using it and um, yeah, there's there's an exciting world on the horizon. And you've got your V is it V tag system, is it, where you can place things in the real world? There's digital content in the real world already, which again is a yeah. prime example of how that uh, that underpinnings of that metaverse works, isn't it? Yeah. So so V tag is an, an avatar based messaging app where uh, you'll be used to being able to. Uh, animate the avatar's face with your facial expressions but you can also animate its body using body tracking and then you can send that to a friend or place it somewhere in using um uh, location markers so when they go past that place they'll be alerted and they can receive your your message there and it plays back uh, full body avatars um obviously there's so many use cases for that that we had to put on hold because of covid having a location based um <laughs> messaging system was probably Bad timing as uh, as COVID started, but as um, as things start to get relaxed, we can start to open that up a little bit more and do more with that. But yeah, it's a very exciting time for the AR world at the moment. I think. I mean, yeah. just touch on something you said before, Simon. And um, you you were talking about the future with glasses and all that. And as you were talking, I was thinking about the positive sides, but I was also thinking about the negative sides. And I have massive issues with the data and privacy at the moment with the internet in general and what's actually happening to technology and us and, us and how it's controlling us. Um, I feel that the, the when you can see all data, you can look at somebody and it tells you every video what they're thinking, what they're doing, what their background is, and that has been used for nefarious purposes. That opens up a can of worms, massively can of worms. You can tell if somebody, you know, what their relationship, where they live, what their health is, what their background is, if they've got any issues, you come to an interview, you can be able to instantly see everything. You know, it's like wearing the heart on the sleeve, but it's like, it sounds like Charlie Book and I'm. Um, and, I, you know, I'm a technologist, but, but I'm a technologist who's a realist. Um, and I do realise unless we attack and, and actually talk about these things openly, a lot of people will not adapt to the technologies we want them to have. Because in their mind, thinking a lot of this stuff. So rather than ignoring it, we should speak about it. We should discuss it more. We should have standards that we, we, we adhere to, all these people. Because this new metaverse universe, if it uses the negative um, things that the general internet has used, we're going to be screwed. Yeah, um, I totally agree. We really, we need to have control of this because yeah. it's, it will spin out of control. And when you've got Neuralink and things plugging into our brains as well, it's a frightening place where this is mm -hmm. going to go to. And we've got to get back to basics a bit with understanding the responsibilities of how we react to this sort of stuff yeah. and what it's actually used for. Um, I also agree with what Max was saying about the um, Apple and the LiDAR stuff. I think that's a game changer. I think completely. Once that the, the phones have that capability, which they do now, we can experiment with it. But that changed everything. I mean, years ago, you were asked to like map cars and 3D, so you could recognise parts of engines and other stuff where they are. And it made that impossible. I mean, it was, it, you, you really struggling now with a live. It's everything so easy on that basis, and um, it really is a join between the physical and digital world. But going back to what Vicky said, we're also doing a location-based thing at the moment. So I've been an, an advisor with the Ordnance Survey. Now they've got this country maps of, uh, to eight millimeter, to eight millimeter accuracy, which I'm poor. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> whoa. And everyone doesn't realize the OS have got all the data everybody needs for 3D yeah. data. But, um, you know, they've got everything. Everyone's trying to recreate something. They've already got it. They've done all the everything. Um, so we're already doing things, but we're not using AR for the first part of it because AR is sort of, you know, making an avatar live or bringing it from 3D, that sort of the gimmick show off there, 
we're looking at the core functionality of what this is at the moment, and we're looking at creating interactive time machines for history. So you can go in any location and rewind time from user-generated content from the people. So everybody leaves a narrative, whether it's a photo or a film from years ago or a story, whatever it is, but all in locations in time. So you can actually go into time vaults in locations and rewind. You can leave things in, in um, places for other people to collect. And what happens um, tomorrow, next week, is history. So is time not a fluid thing to this? So we're looking at things in that basis. AR might come a part of it later on, but that's not the main focus because we just wrote AR. Like, oh, we actually have substance of it's about. It. So we've got to think about things very carefully, not let the technology rule the solution. It'll be the other way around. You have to think about the whole piece of how it all works together. And part of it might be part of it, but we need to think. I, I, I've had a lot of realization um, over the COVID period and a lot of um, reflection of what I do. And I was one of the founders of gamification, and we started a lot of the gamification. And now I'm looking at gamification. I thought gamification was going to be this thing that was positive and encouraged and changed everyone. Now I'm looking at how Facebook uses gamification, how Google uses gamification to manipulate and destroy lives. And that's a massive, massive issue for me personally. I'm like, yeah, the technology's got out of control careful with technology of where we draw the line and where what we should do and rather than rushing into things we need to start talking about this this is so important more important than anything else technology has positive and negative connotations everything does but at the moment we're just ignoring the negative and we're rushing into the positive which will backfire massively backfire we've got to have some sort of control systems with it now but also think about how it is going to affect people's minds being an alternative reality all the time. The problem is at the moment is, you know, we need to question why do we want to escape reality? What's so bad about reality? Vicky said reality is broken. It's been broken for a while, but we don't even know what reality is anymore because reality is a social construct of the narratives that feed us. So, you know, we kind of work out what virtual reality is and augmented reality. We don't even know what reality is. <laughs> so I know we're quite deep here, but we need to be thinking about things in a different way because we don't understand reality. So how the hell can we understand all that reality virtually when most people don't understand what is reality? <laughs> well, like putting the what is aside, what is reality aside, I think we need a, another, another panel <laughs> to talk about that one. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Go the benefit <laughs> of augmented reality is going to be that it actually enriches what we see already. I think that can be a bit of a problem with maybe VR and maybe even like you know, Xbox, you know, like, like standard kind of gaming or that, that kind of usage of technology is that it's really isolating, you're kind of on your own, it's something you're looking at your own screen, you're in your own virtual environment, you've got to map out your space that you're using. But actually, with augmented reality, I think the goal is to keep that social interaction, keep people walking around down the street and, and going to those meetings and having a coffee with somebody. But you could do that in a kind of virtual way, an augmented way. And that's just good. I, I really love Simon's uh, articulation of the kind of future of, of augmented reality and, and kind of uh, wearables moving forward. Because I absolutely agree that's where it's going to go. Um, and I think a testament to that, but you asked the question, Stephanie is um, from Facebook, so they they devote to their Facebook Reality Labs division one, uh, one fifth of their entire workforce, which is 10,000 employees to create in AR and VR, and that's certainly, you know, that kind of um, investment, and that's mirrored in, you know, in Apple, they're rumored to release some glasses in the next uh, couple of years, and Google, Facebook, and, you know, just Microsoft, obviously, with the HoloLens, and I think there's, there's sort of a lot of investment going into this and things like um, one of the great if you get a chance to have a look um, Facebook released a kind of research project on this worn controllers because one of the big kind of problems with it is how we without, without using your thumbs and if you're just putting the glasses how you interact with the digital content and they uh, they released a research project where if you just touch your thumb on your wrist you can move your fingers around you can really feel your sort of, kind of tendons and muscles moving and it, it measures that it looks it looks pretty similar to say like an, an iPhone and an Apple Watch, but it actually measures um, yeah, measures right. your kind of wrist movement so you can interact and move content around, which I think is a really exciting development and the kind of introduction front. 
That does sound incredible. And that did, that did get quite deep there. But I think you're absolutely right, Jeff. These are the conversations that we should be having. It shouldn't just be a race, you know, a technology race that he can develop something the quickest. We do need to sort of sit back and have these more ethical, you know, discussions. I guess the main question is, and you might not, none of you might know this and you might not be involved in this, but how do we kind of you know, set these standards? This is a this is an international you know, industry with, you know, many, many, many different, very complicated sort of structures. And it's not, and it's not really, for my, for my sort of understanding anyway, I, th I think it's still, because everything is so emerging, it's moving so quickly, there aren't really kind of, you know, set, um, there aren't sort of set funding sort of strategies, there aren't set distribution strategies, there aren't, and certainly kind of legislation and, you know, regulation, that's certainly not set either. So, what do you think could be could be done to kind of not necessarily you know halt advancement, but maybe maybe put you know what can be done to basically call on the people who need who need to who need to be called upon to consider these ethical these questions. I kind of feel like the, the world has obviously grown up very quickly to the implications now of data and. I think that is one of the strongest underpinnings of most of these arguments. I kind of think as soon as we as users start understanding the risk of exposing our data and, and controlling our own data, uh, and that's a major topic of conversation at the moment, and I think you know that is going to be a very positive conversation to have because when people are more aware of that, people have been more defensive about it and can choose to withdraw their data. And then you kind of think without all that data and all that information, then a lot of these systems can't exist and can't function. So, you know, it's so I think that topic is a very healthy discussion that's going on at the moment. And I also think the world has woken up to the fact that technology is moving so much quicker than it used to, and therefore things need to be addressed so much quicker than they used to. And I just hope that those sort of two revelations are going to be the underpinnings of a lot of this going forward. I mean, I guess with the, um, I mean, it's a very similar with AI. I mean, obviously, you've seen Musk and his discussions about AI and how AI will destroy us all, um, which I personally completely and utterly agree with. Um, and, you know, AI, AR, we're not all sort of the emergence of it all in this metaverse come across. And, um, you know, these people who invent a lot of these technologies, they're doing it obviously about the money, about the data, and the long term goal of us all in this sort of ecosystem. They're not actually focused on what actually it's going to do to us. I mean, you can see that really what's happened with the internet. Google, Facebook, I don't trust any of them anymore. I think they all need to be broken up in time. But personally, I think they're too big monopolies. Google knows more about me than I know. <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> so I think this should be this new reality. We do need to have some revision. It's just education. It's telling the people, but also telling the people who are making it to think of the long term consequences of the technology and where it will work. So, you know, obviously, years ago when um, they worked out the atom bomb, they, they didn't actually think that's what it was going to be used for eventually. You need to think about that sort of terminology and how it actually works. So a lot of the stuff we do now, we actually go through it and then go, actually, that could be used in a negative way. How do we get around that? And then how do we change? It's just bringing a bit more uh, empathy into technology. Um, and that's what we're about as a company now. And I think everybody just needs to think a bit more in producing things about long term implications of where this leads us. And also to celebrate the wonderful thing that we actually call reality. And, you know, there's a nice, you know, what I was pleased about with AR and obviously the success of Pokemon Go was the fact that it actually made kids go outside. <laughs> they'll be outside for years. They were staring at the screens and they'll soon have glasses on instead, but they went outside to actually have a positive implication that they were going to places that they never went to before. There was negative in instances that certain people, stalkers, knew that lots of kids would be in a certain area, <laughs> but it was positive bits of going outside and everything's got that. So we, could, we just need to think a bit, but I think we do need to have um, a sort of general rules of what we should be thinking about with this. And it is going more into the personalised data issue that I have the, the more issues with. But also, if somebody's first in an alternative reality for a certain, if you've got a virtual reality that is indistinguishable from reality and I'm playing a game which is like a war game will I get post-traumatic stress syndrome if the brain cannot tell the difference in the reality and the virtual reality surely anything that happens in that virtual reality will have the same effect on my brain as if it was reality that's the things we need to be considering 
Note to leave it on there, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> I'm aware that we've uh... <laughs> Right, I think we've, we've, we've come to time, but that, honestly, that was that was such an interesting discussion, and uh, I think has given lots of food for thought. So I really just want to thank you all for taking the time to to come and, and share your thoughts with us. Um, I've just put a link in the in the chat actually um, to a, a boot camp that Creative England are running um, at the end of June, um, which is uh, an introduction to immersive technology, um, and it's a sort of five day. Uh, five half day uh, course where we'll take you through how to sort of go from kind of an idea for an immersive project, whether that be you know VR, or AR, XR, um, all the way through to how to sort of you know project plan it and, and pitch it. So that's for that's with our ID program in Manchester. So that's available for any any businesses in Greater Manchester that's interested in knowing more about immersive. We can take you through, and it's actually Simon who's going to be uh, running that for us, which is which is really great. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, um, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the event. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.